Morning, brothers and sisters. This morning I'd like to share a piece from a book, an old book, uh, by a minister called Joseph Gurney. It's from 1842. I want to present to you the notion that uh, 1 Corinthians 14 type service is not some new teaching or some new desire to worship us as the early church did. But this in every century has been written about. And you know, the word of God never changes and so we change. Traditions come, we add layer and layer of tradition, but the word never changes obviously, which is, it's a lamp into our feet. It draws us back again and again and again to the original plan of God. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, that it never changes. And it writes the course because we can always go back to the original. And so, having said that, Joseph says, in order to bring our subject to a satisfactory conclusion, we must, in the last place, inquire what was the primitive plan of conducting congregational worship. If the, cl if the clerical system which crept into the church in times of diminished vigor and purity, and to which uh, most of the Christians are accustomed to in this present day, had been instituted by our Lord and practiced by the earliest followers, there can be no doubt that we should have found ample notice of these things in Scripture. We should have read of the congregations of the Lord's people, each under the presidency, guidance and teaching of some appointed preacher who should act as the head, the heart, the lungs and uh, the tongue of the whole assembly, on whose lips all were to hang, on whose doctrine all were to depend, to the utter exclusion of the rest of the congregation. But so far as we but so far are we from finding such a pattern in the New Testament that a directly contrary view is there presented to us. The Apostle Paul has given us, incidentally indeed, yet most graphically, a, a living description of the Christian assemblies for divine worship as they were held in his own day. See 1 Corinthians 14. There we find the vocal ministrations practiced on these solemn occasions were in no degree restricted to the individual tenant of a pulpit, but were completely congregational, conducted under the immediate influence of the Holy Spirit in the liberty of the Holy Ghost. One had a psalm, another a doctrine, another a tongue, another a revelation, another an interpretation, and all were poured forth under different administrations, the gifts of the same Spirit. Above all, the blessed gift of prophecy, through which the word of truth was freely preached, was liberally diffused by the great head of the church, so that all might prophesy, when rightly called to the work, and all be edified. Here the, the whole body is represented to us as alive in the natal power of truth, a joint and united spiritual priesthood prepared of the Lord to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted unto God through Jesus Christ. Now, since all the vocal offerings of primitive congregational worship were thus prompted by the moving of the Holy Spirit, it follows when no such divine motion was felt, the congregation must have remained in silence. Nor is it, as I have apprehended, possible that such a system of worship could have been conducted in true decency and order on any other basis. Keep silence before me, all ye islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them draw near, let them speak. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. When we gather in these awful, when we gather in these awful commands, awful meaning full of awe, must surely have been found to have a virtual application to the primitive assemblies of God's people, composed as they were of persons who dared not speak aloud in divine worship except as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. At such times of awful silence, 
the Lord Jesus Christ must have been felt to be present with them, taking the office of preacher into his own hands and ministering to every member of the body according to its need. He is indeed the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which God pitched and not man. Our prophet as well as our priest who still speaks by his spirit with authority as never man spoke. It is only as we are gathered to a living dependence upon his teaching that we can really grow and flourish in religion and bring forth the fruits of righteousness to the praise and glory of God in the whole matter of Christian ministry as its author, conductor, inspirer and theme and above all as he who teaches us immediately by his spirit our Lord Jesus Christ is and ever will be our all in all. Could we but renounce our dependence on the systems, forms and contrivances of men and put the fullness of our trust in his wisdom, love and power, there is every reason to believe that his truth would spread with wondrous energy and mightily would that blessed day be hastened when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and that of his Christ. It's very powerful, isn't it? You know, I think uh, if I was to quote a scripture that would kind of speak to what what this brother has just said, uh, to me it would be Mark 7 when Jesus says, All too well you reject the commandments of men, of God, that you may keep your tradition, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have which you have which you have handed down and many such things you do. Now we have handed down the tradition of the pulpit, I would put it to you. The tradition of the pulpit was raised up in the Reformation. The Eucharist itself as, a, as an idol was torn down and we raised up in its place another idol, the pulpit, which we do not see in the scriptures, which this brother just alluded to. He's talking about being silent in the congregation of the people unless God speaks. Think about this, brothers and sisters. You go into church next Sunday morning, nobody speaks. You sit there, you pray in reverence, you wait upon God. And suddenly from one corner of the congregation, those gathered, Somebody has a song. They stand up and give the song. Another has a word, perhaps related to the song given. And after that word, somebody has a song. Again, I would imagine there'd be a golden thread that would run through the service because the Holy Spirit is indeed leading and guiding. Another has a word perhaps a word of knowledge. You have no idea. You have no idea what to expect when you go into that congregational setting on a Sunday. You have no idea what the Lord is about to say to his people. You see, the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, knows every single person who's sitting there. He knows and has given each a gift and will raise them up to speak in their gift, to use them in their gift, to move, to edify one another. It can't be that simple, Frank. It is that simple. That we lay down the traditions of men, we put them to one side, and we follow the commandments of God. What commandments? Well, read 1 Corinthians 14. See how the scripture tells us, describes to us a service. This man described it as an incidental uh, description of, of a service. Incidental, maybe, indeed, at least in the writings of Paul. But there's nothing incidental in the word, is there? God knows what he, what he has put forth in his word. There's a purpose for it. And so there's a purpose. We have an eternal witness of how a congregational service is conducted. That's how it's conducted in 1 Corinthians 14. 
in, in the description in the dis- prescribed manner of the scriptures. But the Lord himself is the minister of the tabernacle, where he comes, where he orchestrates. He's the one that's doing these things. I would challenge you if you're, if you're a minister of a church. I'm smiling because we are the church, the body of Christ. But if, if you're a minister, you have a gathering, before Sunday comes, before next Sunday comes around, read again 1 Corinthians 14. Consider the words that this man has just spoken. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to lay down the traditions of men, your traditions. Your tradition is that you, 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 you go up onto that platform. You preach for 45 minutes. You sing three songs, five songs. I don't know how many songs, however many songs. And then you dismiss the service. That's the tradition, isn't it? In whatever church you belong to. You know, charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, denominational. It's going to be something along those lines. Three songs, four songs, a sermon, a homily, a benediction, a dismissal, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. Isn't that right? But that's not what we see. It's not what we read in 1 Corinthians 14. We read something alive. Alive. The men and women are being edified. The gifts are being used in every corner of the congregation as the Holy Spirit has has decided to to give by degree, whatever degree he did, decides to give, then that man or that woman is used. And that's the service. Now, I've asked many people, I've asked many pastors over the years, yet, I have yet to get a simple answer. I usually get no answer at all, but my question is, does your service look anything like 1 Corinthians 14? I'm not, I'm not trying to say you should copy, and that wouldn't work. That would uh, kind of defy the very meaning of what we just spoke about, where the God himself is leading the service. But does it look anything like that? And if not, why not? So if you're a pastor out there and you hear this and you've just heard that question, so shoot, me a, shoot me a, I'll publish it on my Facebook, shoot me a, an answer to that question. Does your service look anything like 1 Corinthians 14? And if not, why not? It's the word of God. It's the commandments of God. But Jesus says that we lay aside the commandments of God in favour of our own traditions. Are you doing that? Pastor? Minister? Brothers and sisters, are you sitting under that? Consider these things. Simply the word of God. God bless you, brothers and sisters.